Hello, uh, welcome to this uh, 14th lecture uh, in this uh, physics of uh, materials course. Um, and uh, uh, in the last class, we were uh, looking at uh, the difference between uh, a classical particle uh, and a quantum uh, particle, uh, so to speak. And uh, specifically, we uh, said that uh, uh, classical particles uh, are identical, but distinguishable, which means that uh, if you have two particles at two different energy levels, uh, and you and uh, you maintain this uh, uh, situation that there is a particle at a higher energy level and a particle at a lower energy level. In this situation, if you swap them, that is counted as a different uh, possibility, okay? Because they are distinguishable. Now, quantum mechanical particles are identical but indistinguishable. So, therefore, uh, if you have two particles again occupying two different energy states, uh, if you swap them, that is not counted as a different uh, uh, possibility because. Uh, they are indistinguishable and you do not know if they have already swapped anyway, right. So, uh, uh, I also said upfront we do not know if a particle is a classical particle or a quantum mechanical particle. Uh, so, what we uh, uh, do is we see if uh, which of these two possibilities helps explain all the properties of a collection of those particles and uh, whichever works uh, in, uh, indicates to us that uh, therefore, that particle behaves in a manner which is more consistent with quantum mechanical uh, rules. Okay, so, this is the uh, uh, issue that we discussed in considerable detail last class. Uh, and the reason we came there is because uh, we found that uh, the classical way of uh, counting particles uh, and the microstates that those particles can occupy and therefore, uh, the predictions that uh, the classical uh, approach gives us uh, did not seem accurate, uh, did not seem adequate for explaining the uh, behavior that we were seeing for a collection of electrons right, uh, in a solid even though it seemed pretty good for a collection of atoms in an ideal gas. So, uh, given that we found this limitation, we uh, considered other possibilities and we found that we had this other possibility, uh, uh, which required these uh, electrons to uh, uh, exhibit a behavior, where they were identical, but also indistinguishable. Fine. So, that brings us to this general topic of quantum mechanics. So, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, issue that we need to look at is uh, to see how well uh, we can employ uh, quantum mechanical rules to a collection of electrons uh, in a solid and therefore, see if uh, on based on the application of those rules, are we able to explain the properties of the uh, electrons that a collection of electrons display in a uh, solid. So, this is the direction we are headed towards. So, uh, as we proceed towards this uh, and in our, in our subsequent classes, we will actually get into the mathematics uh, uh, involved uh, in trying to put uh, quantum mechanical rules, uh, um, enforce quantum mechanical rules on electrons. Uh, in terms of trying to understand their behavior. Uh, what I would like to do now is to uh, uh, spend th this class and the next class to take a step back and to look at the uh, origins of quantum mechanics, the history of quantum mechanics um, and the major concepts in quantum mechanics. Uh, it is a very uh, useful exercise for us to undertake, because uh, uh, while we can just go ahead and use those rules, uh, it puts things in perspective to understand how it is that this subject uh, came about and what are the key concepts of this subject and what is the uh, extent to which we can understand uh, the uh, origin of this concepts, where uh, uh, the logic behind these concepts and so on. Uh, and also to see in, 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 uh, in uh, what degrees we are unable to actually uh, uh, come up with a very uh, uh, clear statement on uh, 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 why it is that the rule is what it is and uh, uh, accept it uh, at what level we have to accept it on face value and so on. I would like you to look at the history of it to just see uh, what are the uh, uh, complications uh, associated with how it has come about uh, and so on. So, that we can uh, we can also understand and appreciate our own apprehensions uh, as we try and uh, utilize this uh, uh, tool. Uh, that I must say that uh, uh, there is a vast amount of uh, uh, scientific understanding uh, out there, which is which uh, proves to us definitively that the quantum mechanical rules uh, actually do apply and they apply very well uh, in, a, in a vast majority of the circumstances. And so, therefore, uh, um, we will accept it uh, as it is, but we will also see uh, why is it that some of us when we first uh, experience, uh, when we first uh, encounter quantum mechanics and we, when we first try to use it, we face some difficulties uh, in trying to understand how it is that it is applicable. Okay. So, this, uh, this general uh, uh, issue is, uh, is what we will uh, examine gre in greater detail through this uh, the next couple of classes. So, I have titled these classes as uh, the uh, history of quantum mechanics. 
uh, and uh, on that basis we will look at the people who have done this, uh, uh, who, has, uh, who have opened up this door of quantum mechanics to us and also the uh, uh, circumstances under which they uh, happen to uh, lead us down this path, right. So, we will uh, do, this in, uh, do that in this and the subsequent class. Um, I do not know to what extent you do a general reading of uh, other books uh, associated, uh, popular books associated with science, but uh, in the year 1997 there was a book uh, called The End of Science, uh, published by John Horgan, uh, he is the author of this uh, book and uh, I am sure you can go and look it up in some bookstore uh, or library and uh, possibly you will find uh, this book. Uh, I wish to uh, uh, highlight this book, because uh, actually this book uh, explores this idea that uh, uh, in, this, in the year 1997 or in the year 2000, uh, have we arrived at a state uh, where there is no further science that, uh, uh, that can be discovered, right. So, this is the general idea that is explored uh, in the book, in, in its own format it is uh, explored. Uh, and uh, the basic uh, uh, thinking uh, when we when you talk of such a topic is uh, that today uh, uh, people are aware of uh, you know uh, relativity, people are aware of quantum mechanics, uh, of course people are also aware of the Newtonian mechanics. So, if you take all this body of knowledge together, uh, the argument that uh, somebody might make uh, is that that is all there is in science, I mean uh, we have already reached the limits of science and uh, anything else that you can imagine, anything else let us say the kinds of uh, uh, imaginations that uh, say a science fiction uh, book or a uh, movie uh, um, instills in us, the kind of imagination that in it instills in us is going to remain pure imagination, uh, none of it is going to happen to be true uh, and what we have today is all that we are going to have. The general uh, thinking then is that uh, uh, any further science that we see from here on forward uh, is only going to be incremental science. So, some minor detail here and there which has not been fully thrashed out is going to be uh, explored in greater detail, you are going to have it uh, examined, some few additional uh, constants, uh, uh, a few additional correction factors uh, are going to come into the picture, but that is about it. The basic science as is, is all there is, is the general uh, thinking that uh, some people uh, have and this is the general idea that is uh, uh, being explored uh, in this kind of a book. Um, well, this is uh, the book as you can see was published in 1997, right. If you go back about 100 years, 100 years earlier than this, so just before the year 1900, you will be surprised to find that in fact, the thinking at that stage was also the same, that uh, around the year 1900, there were a lot of people who believed that all that was uh, available to be discovered in science was already done. In fact, there were people who believed that uh, and even stated perhaps that there was no uh, further use in joining uh, uh, physics, there was no real future in uh, getting into physics. because everything that needed to be discovered had already been discovered, there was nothing of any great relevance that remained, there was no real future so to speak in, uh, in the pure science uh, so to speak, because everything had been discovered, only some minor details uh, remained to be uh, ironed out. And you can imagine that clearly that you know there has been a, a world of a difference since uh, then to now. So, uh, uh, you are aware that there has been a big difference in the last 100 years in terms of uh, everything that we have learnt about uh, our universe. In fact, even in the even though we say now that you know maybe we have learnt everything about science now, uh, as of now, uh, even at this time we recognize that if, if you do a popular reading, you find that uh, for example, the universe, uh, there is enough uh, uh, reason to believe that all our knowledge is able to explain only about 10 to 20 percent of the universe. There is a very large percentage of the universe uh, which, the, which is generally being described as dark matter and dark energy for which there is no uh, known uh, explanation at this point in time. There is no clear understanding of this kind of a phenomena, a except that the overall behavior of the universe seems to indicate that there is a dark energy and a dark matter, but beyond that we do not seem to know much. So, you can understand that you know on the one hand we think we know a lot, when we know when we say that you know we know relativity or at least when we say we know relativity, at least there are some people in the world who know relativity and some people in the no world who know quantum mechanics very well. If you say that that is the case, uh, even with that there is only uh, so much that we understand of the universe. So, uh, on the one hand it is tempting to think that we have learnt everything, uh, on the other hand uh, it is with humility that we need to recognize that there is a lot that remains to be found out about the universe around us. So, this is as of today and 100 years ago the feeling was the same as I mentioned uh, around the year 1900, the feeling was that there is nothing left to be discovered in science uh, and uh, everything had already been done, right. So, uh, uh, so this is the uh, background that existed at that point in time and uh, 
again at that point in time also the feeling was that you know just a few uh, minor details needed to be uh, uh, figured out and the, and those were also just some corrective factors at most some minor corrective factor which had to be incorporated in the uh, general theory of uh, whatever we we had for everything and then all the details would fall in place so this is the uh, uh, general idea that existed around the year 1900 around that year uh, if you look at the science that had evolved uh, up until that point there were specific uh, experiments uh, which gave uh, uh, data or therefore and therefore we would call them experimental phenomena which were not fully explained okay so uh, a few of them are listed here uh, one is black body radiation which we will talk about uh, in a, in greater detail uh, 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 immediately in the uh, during this class uh, the other is uh, the discrete nature of atomic and molecular uh, uh, spectra. So, uh, you, you can see this uh, atomic and molecular uh, spectra. So, it turns out that you know when you have uh, uh, atoms and so on and you excite them, uh, you uh, give them energy and, and you look at uh, uh, the uh, spectrum of energy coming off of them, uh, the, the, it does not come out uniformly across all wavelengths. The, uh, uh, so, an excited atom with enough energy when it uh, starts releasing energy does not give out energy in, uh, in all uh, wavelengths uniformly. There are specific wavelengths which have uh, high intensity and many wavelengths where there is no intensity. That concept itself was not something that had uh, any good explanation uh, in terms of the general understanding of uh, how atoms were and how electrons were within those atoms and so on that existed up until that point. So, that was some, that was some data that uh, people did not have an understanding on. Then there is uh, something that we call Compton modified scattering, right. So, uh, this was uh, this came along uh, as a result of uh, uh, explorations that people uh, explorations and uh, experiments that people did uh, in terms of uh, how x rays interacted with matter. So, I think around the year 1923 this was uh, uh, discovered. Uh, it was noticed that uh, you know x ray photons uh, or x rays, uh, we would not call them photons at that, sta at that stage, we uh, uh, that was still an evolving concept x rays which uh, 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 which interacted with matter uh, and you examined the uh, wavelength of the x ray after it came off of that interaction with matter. Uh, so, after it interacted with the sample you look at the uh, x ray that is coming off of the sample and you look at its wavelengths. Uh, uh, what was found was even though you sent in a specific wavelength the uh, 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 in the uh, uh, wavelengths coming out of the sample. So, you can see intensities uh, at wavelengths uh, that are longer than the wavelength of the radiation that was sent in. Uh, typically it would only be uh, intensities at wavelengths longer, uh, but there was some chance that you could also see intensities at wavelengths uh, lower than the uh, wavelength that was sent in. Uh, but this meant that the uh, wavelength of the x-ray being sent in was being changed in some manner and at that point there was no clear explanation of how this could be uh, uh, ex uh, explained. Uh, this change in wavelength was referred to as uh, this modified scattering, this Compton modified scattering named after the person who uh, discovered it, uh, he also got a Nobel prize for it. So, uh, there was no clear uh, uh, understanding on how this could happen, but it was uh, uh, shown that it, it was happening. Okay. So, this was a very important thing. Uh, similarly, there was also an uh, effect which was experimentally known, uh, which is the photoelectric effect, where it was known that you know if you take uh, uh, certain surfaces and then uh, you have an incident radiation uh, on it, then uh, at some uh, under some conditions electrons would come off of that surface. What was generally known was that uh, if you uh, if you were used certain uh, up to if you change the frequency of the light incident on that surface, up to a certain frequency, nothing, no electron would come off of that sample. If you cross that frequency, if you went higher than that frequency, uh, electrons would start coming off of the sample. The intensity of the light falling on the uh, uh, sample, uh, if effectively, uh, uh, if if the frequency was not high enough, it it didn't matter how how intense the uh, radiation was you would not have any electrons coming off of that sample. Okay. So, uh, there was some uh, issue associated with the frequency of that radiation and, uh, and that sample and so on before you could see uh, uh, electrons coming off of it. This was the photoelectric effect, again there was no good uh, explanation on uh, how this could uh, uh, be explained and why intensity made uh, did not seem to have any difference on the uh, uh, on whether or not an electron came off if the uh, frequency was not high enough. So, these were all specific experimental phenomena. Uh, there were also uh, experiments associated with specific heat, which also did not have uh, specific heat of uh, the solids at very low temperatures was again something that was not clearly explained uh, in terms of uh, uh, whatever was known. So, there were a lot of uh, such uh, experiments, uh, but mostly it was felt that these were uh, experiments which uh, uh, were at one end of some extreme uh, conditions that we were looking at and then uh, uh, it was always felt that uh, in some way the existing knowledge could be marginally extended and we would be able to explain uh, this uh, phenomenon. 
Now, uh, of these uh, set of unexplained uh, phenomena that existed uh, around the year 1900, uh, all of these were being exp uh, explored by a variety of scientists and uh, black body radiation was uh, one of those uh, unexplained phenomena which was also being examined and uh, it, it was the uh, uh, this specific examination of black body uh, phenomena that led to uh, uh, quantum, mechanic, uh, quantum mechanics uh, being discovered so to speak. So, uh, we will look now at how this happened so uh, and just see what uh, what is the uh, 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 process by which this has happened. So, um, what was uh, known at that point in uh, time was that uh, uh, if you actually take a body um, and you uh, based on the temperature of the body it would give out radiation. Okay, any body based on the temperature uh, of the body would give out some radiation. So, for example, even we are giving out infrared radiation. Okay. So, that is why for example, the, uh, uh, at our temperature our body temperature we give out uh, infrared radiation. Most objects at ro room temperatures uh, will, uh, will tend to give out infrared radiation. So, uh, in fact, that is why if you go to the military they have uh, infrared goggles. Right. So, they if they are looking for people uh, and it is dark uh, you are not seeing visible light you are not able to see the person. If you have infrared uh, uh, based uh, uh, goggles you can actually see the uh, infrared radiation coming off of people. Right. So, this is how uh, this process is uh, being used. At all temperatures you will have some radiation coming out which is characteristic of that uh, 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 temperature uh, typically and for example, if you raise it uh, several hundred degrees C move towards 1000 degrees C uh, kind of range then you start seeing visible light. So, uh, so that is why hot objects start giving out visible light right. So, and that is how you even see uh, white light coming off of the sun it is very hot it is of the order of about 6000 degrees C is the uh, surface temperature of the sun. So, uh, this general idea was known that you can actually have uh, 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 radiation coming off of uh, electromagnetic radiation coming off of a body uh, which is uh, sort of related to the uh, temperature at which uh, that body is and it would be a spectrum you would actually get a spectrum coming off of it which means you would actually get a range of wavelengths coming off of that uh, body and when, when I say that it is mostly infrared or mo uh, mostly visible we mean a, a much higher intensity is in that frequency range. So, that is what we mean, but uh, across a variety of frequencies you will you will still get uh, uh, some radiation coming out of it. So, in this context uh, uh, a, 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 an object was uh, uh, sort of imagined which was called the black body and then people uh, attempted to create it where the uh, uh, as you can uh, as you may be aware if you take light and you make it incident on uh, on any object then you could have some of it reflected some of it absorbed and some of it transmitted. So, all these things could occur right. So, uh, uh, a hypothetical body was imagined which would actually then absorb all radiation ok. So, if you put any radiation on it it would absorb it and then uh, if it if it were if it were cold for example. So, it would keep absorbing radiation till its energy reaches the uh, energy that is the ambient energy and then it would uh, not be able to uh, then it will remain uh, as it is. Then if you raise it if it is hotter than the uh, uh, surroundings then it will give out radiation. Okay, so, and so there is no transmission and there is no reflection associated with this body. So, this is considered as a black body right and uh, people try to design it uh, and uh, in a sense there is no perfect black body, but uh, typically graphite uh, surface is, is a surface that would uh, get very close to absorbing all the radiation that falls on it. So, uh, uh, in uh, 1859 uh, Kirchhoff is uh, uh, credited with uh, creating the black body. So, which is what you see on your uh, uh, slide here. So, uh, this is then the entrance of uh, the black body. So, uh, radiation would come in through this entrance. Uh, this is actually a sphere a section of the sphere is what I am showing you here cross section of the sphere. So, radiation would come here it would uh, strike this uh, conical uh, uh, section here and then uh, the radiation would then reflect off into all the interiors of this uh, uh, object. And so, uh, whatever uh, light is entering this or any electromagnetic radiation that is entering here has an opportunity to get trapped within it and this inner surface is all uh, uh, graphitic uh, based surface. So, it captures all the radiation and then if, if this is uh, hotter than the surroundings then by a similar uh, analogous process the radiation that comes out of this uh, uh, body. So, uh, you can uh, you can run controlled experiments where you can actually keep this uh, black body at a very specific temperature and uh, at that temperature you can uh, look at the radiation that is coming off of this body and uh, make a, a, a plot of uh, how much radiation is coming out at what wavelength right. So, how much intensity is coming out at what wavelength. So, this is the uh, basic uh, information that you you can uh, uh, record. Now, uh, having done this what was known about uh, the uh, black body uh, radiation are two facts. So, the first one is listed here uh, as temperature T of the body increases uh, the intensity of the radiation from the body also increases ok. 
So, uh, basically if you raise the temperature of the body, the intensity of radiation coming from the body increases. So, this is something that was uh, uh, known and the uh, as I said you know there is a distribution of uh, radiation across a, a range of wavelengths right. So, uh, there is when you look at this distribution and I will show you a plot of this distribution, we will even draw it uh, on the board in a moment. Uh, when you look at this distribution, you find that there is uh, uh, a particular wavelength at which the uh, uh, intensity is the maximum. Okay. So, uh, in all other wavelengths it uh, drops off, it, it decreases and then at some point there may be some limits to this uh, uh, diagram so to speak, but basically you have this uh, process occurring. You have some particular wavelength which at which you get the maximum intensity. And what was found is that the higher the temperature of the body, lower is the wavelength of the most intense part of the spectrum. Okay. So, these are two things that are uh, known about uh, uh, this, uh, were known about this radiation. So, we will just see how this uh, uh, radiation looks and uh, uh, we will, uh, uh, I mean we will examine this, uh, uh, these two points a little uh, more carefully. So, what we have here on the uh, x axis is uh, wavelength. Okay. So, wavelength is on the x axis. On the y axis we are plotting spectral radiation, uh, radiance, right. So, what uh, spectral radiance is, is simply it is a, uh, it is intensity per unit wavelength. Okay. So, that is, why, so intensity would be, uh, so we will just uh, plot this and we will just see what uh, it looks like. So, this is wavelength and this is spectral radiance. And we see that the units for this are watts per meter cube. Okay. So, if you see, uh, if you uh, uh, look at it this way, if you talk of uh, um, uh, energy, uh, the units will be in joules. Uh, we want uh, energy per uh, unit area. So, that will be in joules per meter square. If you want power per unit area, that would be in uh, joules per meter square per second or effectively watts per meter square, right. And uh, is the spectral radiance is power per unit area uh, per uh, unit wavelength, so to speak, okay. So, there, therefore, spectral radiance. is uh, in watts per meter square per uh, wavelength we can write again in meters uh, sometimes it will be written in uh, uh, micrometers or whatever, but in principle we could write it like this. So, therefore, this would be watts per meter cube. Okay, so, we can write it in watts per meter cube. So, this is uh, spectral radiance uh, 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 the uh, and we will just leave it at that for the moment and uh, basically to look at our plot it looks something like this. So, something like this is what we have in our plot. Uh, so, uh, when we look at spectral radiance, uh, the intensity is simply the uh, uh, power per unit area. So, the intensity, uh, so when you look at a black body and you look at every wavelength, uh, you look at the radiation coming off of the black body and then you examine every wavelength. Every wavelength you see what is the uh, uh, spectral radiance that is coming and then you make a plot of all those points and then you uh, come up with this uh, curve, right. The, uh, when you say, uh, when you talk of intensity, what you are talking of is the area under this curve. Okay. So, the area under this curve, so whatever this is, this is r, let us say this is r, right. So, intensity i, uh, which is then a function of the actual temperature it is in, uh, will simply be So, across all wavelengths we can uh, integrate the uh, spectral radiance uh, 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 and the uh, I mean with respect to lambda and then uh, you will what you get is the area under this curve which is the intensity, right. So, uh, we said that, uh, so we can do this. So, in an experiment this is what is being done for a black body. This is the kind of data that is being obtained from a black body. Now, uh, uh, we can uh, at every given temperature, at a given temperature you will get a given curve. So, at a specific temperature you get this curve. So, when I draw this curve, this is for a specific temperature. As I mentioned, uh, at a given, uh, at any given temperature there is a specific wavelength, this lambda here, this is wavelength lambda, right. 
So, this wavelength uh, lambda, so we can put this in uh, meters or uh, whatever, whatever is the appropriate uh, uh, thing, we, you, SI units will put meter there for the moment. So, uh, there is a particular wavelength which corresponds to the maximum spectral radiance that you are getting, right. So, uh, this maximum wavelength uh, and uh, this maximum wavelength that you see is very characteristic of the temperature of that body. So, this is the uh, uh, important information related to the black body radiation. So, if you change the temperature, so let us say we go to a higher temperature, right. So, if you go to a higher temperature, what is uh, uh, essentially being seen is that uh, uh, we will just take a different color chalk here and uh, make a plot of it. So, uh, at a higher uh, temperature, you will see something like this and this is just a schematic that I am drawing for you here. Uh, basically, what uh, what I wish to point out for you uh, is that uh, uh, so at a higher temperature, basically what I want to uh, point out for you is that uh, there are two things that we see at a higher temperature. First is that the total area under this curve is now going up, right? So, at the higher temperature which is the blue, uh, so we have uh, T 1 and then we have uh, T 2. So, T 2 is greater than uh, T 1. Uh, so, at a higher temperature what we see is that the total area uh, under the curve has gone up, which, uh, which is consistent uh, with, the, uh, with the information that we are uh, claiming that this in, uh, data is giving, which is that uh, the uh, intensity associated with this uh, object has gone up. Okay? So, intensity has gone up and that is why the uh, uh, area under the curve has gone up uh, and the uh, uh, wavelength corresponding to the wavelength corresponding to the maximum point is a lower wavelength. Okay? So, those are two things. So, so, this is how the experimental data came out. So, the data comes out like this, it turns out that if you do the comparisons, the area under the curve at a lower temperature is less than the area under the curve when the temperature is higher. The uh, maximum point of the uh, uh, of the curve uh, will be at a lower wave uh, at a higher wavelength at a lower temperature and at a lower wavelength at a higher temperature. So, these are the things that uh, come out and so you can get this for a variety of different uh, uh, temperatures and so on. So, at some other temperature even lower temperature it will move forward. So, this is the uh, uh, basic uh, way in which this uh, curve develops. Okay? So, so this is black body radiation and this is the way uh, it has come about. Right? So, we will now uh, look at the uh, other analysis associated with this black body radiation. So, uh, if you look again at this curve that I have uh, put uh, plotted here, the same uh, what I have drawn on the board is exactly what we see here. This is spectral radiance, this is uh, the maximum uh, wavelength corresponding to the maximum uh, uh, intensity or uh, yeah, maximum uh, spectral radiance and then uh, this area under the curve gives you the total intensity. So, this is what we are uh, dealing with when we talk of black body radiation. So, the two points that we mentioned which is that uh, the uh, intensity goes up with temperature and uh, that this maximum wavelength decreases with uh, increase in temperature. These two are captured by two equations which uh, fit the data so to speak. right? So, the first one is the Stefan Boltzmann's law, okay? Stefan Boltzmann's law which says that the total intensity uh, associated with the black body at a given temperature T okay, equals sigma T power 4. So, this is something you would have probably seen in your uh, high school. Uh, so, I is sigma T power 4 where uh, sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant and it has this value 5.67 10 power minus 8 watts per meter square per Kelvin power 4. Okay, so, uh, if you know that uh, if you know the temperature, uh, you can actually calculate the intensity. This constant happens to be there. So, you are uh, able to do this. You can match this with experimental data and this is what you will get. Then there is something called the Wien's displacement law, okay? Wien's displacement law which, which basically captures this uh, information that uh, uh, as the temperature changes the uh, wavelength corresponding to the maximum of the uh, uh, of that spectrum also changes. So, that equation then works out to this lambda max T equals a constant. In other words, the product of the uh, temperature and the wavelength that gives you the maximum uh, spectral radiance. So, that wavelength gives you which gives you the maximum spectral radiance and uh, the product of that with the temperature is a constant which works out to this uh, uh, number here. So, therefore, as the temperature goes up, the lambda max has to come down. Right, that is what is because it is a constant. So, uh, we are, these two have to be inversely related. So, as it goes one goes up the other comes down. And as I put down there the spectral radiance r lambda t lambda and t 
is defined such that uh, the uh, r lambda uh, space t d lambda is the power per unit area whose wavelength lies uh, between lambda and d lambda right so this is on a per uh, 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 area and uh, the power uh, on the within that uh, wavelength uh, regime so when you do the integration from zero to infinity of this uh, uh, spectral radiance then you get the total intensity and this i is what is given by the stefan boltzmann uh, stefan boltzmann law right so now the thing about the black body radiation is that the uh, people once the stefan boltzmann's law was put together this way and this recognition was there uh, people had an uh, explanation or at least understood how this came about or at least to understood that there is this relationship that sigma t power 4 uh, was uh, matching the uh, 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 intensity and this sigma was an universal constant and similarly this wines displacement law told us about the maximum the issue that was there that was un unresolved with respect to uh, the uh, black body radi radiation was the exact nature of this r lambda comma t okay or rather the spectral radiance the spectral radiance was then the uh, information that told us uh, or uh, that encapsulated this information that uh, at a given wavelength what is the uh, intensity that is going to come out right. So, this is the information uh, power per unit area okay. So, the power per unit area at that wavelength. So, a, a fundamental understanding of how uh, um, electromagnetic radiation interacts with matter a fundamental understanding of how electromagnetic radiation interacts with matter is necessary for us to give an equation which then tells us how this r lambda is the, the form of r lambda right r lambda says this is the amount of uh, energy per unit area per unit time that is going to come out at this particular wavelength that information will now have to be consistent with our understanding of how matter interacts with radiation because only if we have a consistent uh, only if our understanding of interaction of matter with radiation is correct we will be able to write an equation saying that therefore at this temperature so much of energy will come out per unit area per unit time at this uh, particular wavelength okay. So, uh, so therefore, it was necessary to see uh, what is the form of this r lambda. So, a lot of work was done to see what is the form of r lambda to see uh, what is the equation that we can come up with for r lambda uh, which, which would then have to be from first principles which would then have to be associated with our understanding of uh, 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 the exact nature of matter, the nature of light, how uh, light interacts with matter and so on. So, a lot of work was done in this regard. Now, uh, the first attempt or one of the early attempts I would not say the first attempt one of the early attempts to do this uh, uh, process uh, to come up with an explanation of what is the what is r lambda and what is the form of r lambda uh, is credited to Rayleigh and Jean and uh, what they say what they did is they looked at uh, in fact uh, the possibility that the entire interaction is uh, occurring in a classical manner uh, and which means there is uh, what is uh, referred to as equipartition of energy. So, a, any energy being uh, uh, sent to a uh, absorbed by a body is absorbed equally by all modes in which it can absorb the energy. So, any translational uh, mode, any rotational mode, it is always equally absorbed by all the modes and uh, in that case the, va the value of uh, r lambda t works out to something like this okay, uh, 8 pi k t by lambda power 4 right. So, uh, the uh, issue here is that if you look at this equation 8 pi k t by lambda power 4. Uh, the uh, uh, issue with this equation is that uh, if you keep decreasing lambda as lambda goes closer and closer to 0 r lambda t will keep on going up ok. So, so as lambda tends to 0 r lambda will tend to infinity right. So, if you if you if you take this to be the value of r lambda uh, uh, and and say that this is the correct expression for r lambda then what you will happen uh, what you will find is that you will find a, uh, uh, the theoretical curve looking quite different from the experimental curve. What will the difference be? We will see that on the board. So, the Rayleigh Jean uh, expression we have uh, r lambda is 8 pi k t by lambda power 4 right. So, this is what we have. So, if you see here uh, if you take this expression and you make a plot of this. So, uh, effectively this is the plot that is uh, going to show up uh, uh, on this uh, curve here. So, what you will see is uh, you should see a plot that looks something like this and let us say we are doing it for this higher temperature uh, uh, T 2. So, you will see a plot that looks like this uh, where actually as the lambda goes to higher and higher values. So, it is going in this direction the r lambda keeps decreasing and therefore, you see a curve that comes like this 
and in fact it turns out that when you compare it with experimental data the match of experimental data you can see that even on the board the match of the experimental data with this uh, curve that is being predicted by the Rayleigh gene uh, uh, formula uh, begins to match very well as you go to higher and higher wavelengths. As you go to lower and lower wavelengths uh, the uh, uh, lambda power 4 being in the denominator simply means that this curve will go uh, climb up to infinity indefinitely right. So, it will go up and it will actually essentially go to infinity. So, in fact this law predicted that uh, you would have uh, what is called an ultra, uh, ult, uh, ultraviolet catastrophe is the way it was described. Uh, so, ultraviolet catastrophe uh, simply uh, captures this idea that at any given temperature you will have uh, infinite radiation coming out at uh, lower and lower and lower frequencies uh, I am sorry lower and lower lower wavelengths or higher and higher frequencies. Uh, we know from, uh, uh, from our daily experience that this is not the case. Okay, so, in a daily experience if you take a body it is not giving out a, any body it is not giving you infinite radiation at uh, higher and higher frequencies or lower and lower wavelengths. We know for a fact that the curve actually looks like this. So, uh, if you go past a point it actually drops back to 0. So, the Rayleigh gene law was uh, unable to actually explain why this drop off comes. Okay, so, it goes up and eventually it starts dropping off. So, while the match is very good at higher uh, wavelengths the match is uh, not just poor it is just completely unmatched with the data there is no match between the data and the uh, theoretical curve if you go to lower wavelengths. And this was based on a classical uh, formulation of uh, this idea that you have equipartition of energy that you have at all uh, at any given wavelength any given frequency uh, the body can absorb the frequency can give out the frequency and it will it will equally distribute across all the uh, uh, all the uh, modes in which it can uh, absorb or uh, give out this energy. So, this is what the Rayleigh gene uh, formulation was. So, then uh, uh, Planck looked at this uh, uh, problem and he dealt with it differently uh, and he came up with an expression which is uh, uh, put down here where he basically had 8 pi c h by lambda power phi and 1 by e power h c by lambda k t minus 1. Okay. So, this is an expression that he came up with which is uh, different uh, and uh, we will uh, examine this in, in uh, just we will just say that he, he came up with this expression. The uh, uh, basic idea that he uh, had was that uh, he basically said so uh, that when you uh, when you have uh, when you take an uh, take a body and actually it uh, let us say it uh, it is uh, absorbing some radiation what it means is that uh, uh, he considered the possibility that when you see a certain frequency uh, coming from a body or a certain frequency being absorbed by the body it means that an uh, an oscillator of that particular frequency is now active is the uh, concept that is being used okay. and he considered the possibility that for an oscillator to be active uh, you would have to provide at least a certain minimum amount of energy. Okay. So, uh, at that point in time he did not know uh, exactly what that minimum energy would be uh, he just said that there is uh, a certain energy. Uh, so, if you have a certain frequency uh, you could have uh, uh, only energy only if it were uh, uh, as constant times that frequency that amount of energy only would then uh, be would be required to uh, uh, excite that particular oscillator if you had less than that energy you would not be able to excite that oscillator. So, he just arbitrarily put this in this was a, a process that he uh, initiated arbitrarily and then uh, he just wanted to see if this would help uh, explain the uh, data. So, he came up with an expression that looked like this right. So, uh, uh, his basic uh, uh, argument was that if you go to uh, 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 lower and lower wavelengths right. So, the uh, energy uh, quantum required so the amount of energy uh, because it is a lower wavelength if you write E equals h nu he did not know what this constant E was. So, for this so this is uh, so if you write the Planck approach. So, he his uh, uh, thing is uh, okay, and uh, we have uh, 1 by So, this is the expression that uh, uh, Planck's uh, uh, equation comes out with uh, and his basic idea was as I mentioned that uh, 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 if you look at uh, the uh, possibility he considered the possibility that for a particular uh, uh, frequency to become active either in terms of absorbing it or in terms of uh, releasing it uh, you you have to provide at least a certain minimum am amount of energy h nu. Okay. So, uh, some uh, constant times this uh, uh, frequency uh, and so if you went to higher and higher frequency in other words you went to when you go to lower and lower wavelengths right the uh, as the frequency goes up this h nu becomes a very large number right. 
So, if the energy available in the system is not that high, this h nu may become larger than that am, uh, amount of energy available. Therefore, you will not be able to uh, uh, excite this particular frequency, right. So, uh, you have energy being supplied to the system, ok. So, you are uh, providing some energy to the system. Now, that energy has some uh, value. So, as the, as the uh, and that can be shared across various frequencies. When the frequency is very low, uh, it is able to uh, uh, the uh, oscillators are actually active at that frequency, because the energy that you are supplying is much larger than the h nu corresponding to that particular frequency. That nu is a very small number in that case and therefore, the h nu corresponding to it is a small number. This h he did not know what it was, it was a constant that he, ha he was at that point in time not aware of, he just assumed that there was a constant. And so, if the frequency is a small number, ok. So, it is inversely related to wavelength. So, if frequency is a small number that means, you are talking in this region higher wavelengths lower frequency. If frequency is a small number h nu is a small number ok. So, uh, therefore, you need only a tiny amount of energy to activate an oscillator that has this frequency ok. So, so if you provide a certain amount of energy to the object there is a good chance that the uh, lower frequencies can anyway become active, because they are in a position they are all much smaller than the energy that you are providing. So, thousands of oscillators or millions of oscillators having this frequency can become active. So, therefore, they are able to absorb that energy it's, and similarly later on even give out that energy. If you go to higher and higher frequencies which you come here this h nu the same some constant which he was still unaware of some h nu h times nu this value of h nu at, at the very high frequencies in other words low wavelengths high frequencies the value of h nu becomes large ok. Because it becomes large if the energy you are providing to the system is not large enough to be equal to that h nu you are not activating that uh, particular oscillator right. So, he just put in this rule to see if uh, in, in what way you can uh, create a situation where uh, certain frequencies uh, are, uh, are actually uh, switched on so to speak and certain switch, uh, frequencies end up having to get switched off keeping in mind the fact that at, at higher frequencies it anyway drops to 0. So, we find that there is a, a by putting in this particular restriction that uh, the energy that can be absorbed or can be given out by the system has uh, something to do with that frequency and uh, the, and it comes off as this constant times this frequency some unknown constant times this frequency. We, ca we find that we are able to create a situation or he found that he was able to create the situation that at lower frequencies that uh, step that step size h nu we can call that a step size or a quantum that is uh, that uh, step size is small enough that when you provide energy to the system several thousand oscillators of that frequency can become active. At high frequency the h nu is large. So, when you provide a certain amount of energy to the system uh, it is less than that h nu and therefore, the system is unable to absorb that energy uh, at or uh, rather unable to absorb it at that frequency. It is not uh, that uh, an, uh, an oscillator of that frequency is unable to switch on and pick up that energy right. So, so there is uh, you need to provide at least this much amount of energy before even one oscillator of this frequency will be able to uh, become active. If you provide anything less than this, this oscillator will not become active right. So, this is the uh, uh, general idea that he put together. When he did this, he had no idea what this value of h would be ok. He simply assumed that uh, as a attempt to curve fit this data and attempt to try to understand what is the how can you uh, explain this kind of a data. He assumed that this, a this was a possibility and he enforced this possibility in his theoretical uh, calculation. When he did this possibility, he came out with a value of uh, for r that came out like this ok. And uh, when you do this, it he found that uh, uh, by coming out with this kind of an expression, he was actually getting a very good curve fit ok. And uh, in fact, what he did is he came up with this expression assuming that there is some h constant h which he did not know what it was. And then with this information, he uh, changed the value of h in this c is the speed of light. So, that is fixed lambda we know from the data the temperature of that body is fixed uh, k is Boltzmann's constant. So, all these things are fixed. So, only thing that is unknown is h right. So, h is a constant that he, he thought might exist. So, he just put it in and he came up with this expression. So, now you can do a curve fit where you can try various values of h and see under what conditions the uh, experimental data and the theoretical data match. So, this is what he did. And, uh, uh, and what he found was that uh, at a particular value of h the match was very good ok. And incidentally if you compare this expression with this expression what we will see is that when uh, lambda becomes high this expression will reduce to this expression ok. So, therefore, this uh, uh, Rayleigh gene law as it is called is, uh, is correct at higher uh, wavelengths and the Planck uh, law reduces to the Rayleigh gene law at higher wavelengths. So, that uh, therefore, this, this expression becomes consistent with this expression. 
Only thing is at lower wavelengths, uh, I am sorry, at, uh, yeah, at lower wavelengths when the uh, frequency is going up, this law fails, it makes no change for lower wavelengths, but clearly this is a different uh, expression for lower wavelengths, right. So, that is the difference. So, uh, what we see is that at high lambda, we can make the approximation that this uh, e power h c by lambda k t minus 1 works out to this expression here. So, e power h c by lambda k t will be 1 plus h c by lambda k t plus other terms minus 1. So, it becomes h c by lambda k t, right. So, and this uh, what I have put here is in fact this denominator. So, this denominator is now this term here h c by lambda k t. So, if you put h c by lambda k t here, lambda k t will go to the numerator that lambda and 1 uh, lambda power 5 will become lambda power 4 and uh, if you do the, if you simplify it, you will get exactly this expression. The h c will again cancel out, this h c will cancel out with this h c, right. So, you will get 8 pi k t by lambda power 4. So, this is, uh, so it is very clear that from, uh, the, from a mathematical perspective, uh, the Planck's expression is exactly the Rayleigh gene expression at uh, higher, uh, um, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at higher lambdas, okay, at higher wavelengths. So, these two become consistent with each other at higher. So, what happened was uh, Planck had actually uh, looked at the black body radiation and tried to see in uh, what way he can explain, uh, what additional rules he can place on the system, which would help him uh, get a good fit between the experimental data and the theory that he had come up with. And he found that if you put in this rule, wherein uh, the energy being uh, absorbed is uh, in some way related to the frequency uh, and that the, there is a certain step size uh, associated with the energy, which is related to the frequency and that you cannot just arbitrarily uh, put in whatever energy at whatever wavelength. At every given wavelength, uh, only if you have a certain amount of energy, the system will accept energy at that wavelength, okay. So, it will be accepting energy, the, the uh, object still absorbs, uh, absorbs energy. The question is at what wavelength is it absorbing the energy, okay, or what set of wavelengths it is absorbing the energy. It turns out that at a given wavelength, it will absorb only if there is a certain minimum energy available commensurate with that wave, uh, wavelength, okay. Only then it will absorb. If it is, if the step size is not equal to a certain value, it cannot absorb at that wavelength. It will have to absorb at some other wavelength. So, that is the basic idea that he got, uh, got together. And as I said, he did a curve fit with experimental data and he obtained a value for h. That value at, uh, on the day that he published this paper, which incidentally is 1901 when he published this paper, the value he came up with was 6.55 10 power minus 34 joules second. Of course, he had it in uh, non-SI units at that point in time. The current accepted value is 6.626 10 power minus 34 joules second. So, you can see that, you know, in 1901 by doing a curve fit, he came up with a value which is very close to the current uh, accepted value, right. So, uh, this is how uh, uh, he had uh, uh, come about this uh, uh, process, gone about this process. So, what has actually happened is, uh, in this process, he had inadvertently uh, stumbled upon this idea that uh, energy uh, as it relates to electromagnetic radiation uh, has something of a step size associated with it and that uh, you have to, uh, the conventional thinking that had been there up until that point that energy was uh, at, uh, in, in the radiation and the manner in which matter and uh, radiation exchange and energy was continuous and smooth and everything, that uh, concept had to be re-examined. Uh, and he had stumbled upon this fact that the process by which energy is uh, transferred between uh, matter and uh, radiation uh, has some uh, has some step size associated with it and that you need at every given wavelength at least that much step size for that transaction to occur. So, he had stumbled upon this uh, idea. So, for doing this, uh, a, this step size or quantum as it became uh, came to become uh, referred to uh, is the starting point for the entire field of quantum mechanics. So, what started as a curve fit, what started as an attempt to uh, clear up those small pieces of experimental data, which apparently people uh, did not understand, uh, then became the starting point for an entire field of science, okay. So, his attempt to do this, this single paper that he published uh, in 1901 is considered as the starting point for quantum mechanics and we consider that as a very significant uh, contribution. Today, uh, there is a lot of science that we do, uh, which fundamentally uh, uh, owes uh, its uh, origin, uh, so to speak to this disc, uh, discovery of his uh, and then uh, uh, its subsequent development and use. In fact, even at the time that he did this, he, he, he himself was not completely convinced or completely sure of what exactly he had done. He just had done something that he himself felt was, you know, a kind of a curve fit that helped explain the data. He was not so, uh, the, uh, uh, the general belief is that he himself was not so convinced that nature in fact behaved like this. It, it, it was a very 
difficult uh, thing to accept that nature had some uh, step size associated with how it went about things and then that, that if you did not have this uh, quantum uh, uh, process uh, involved certain things would not occur. So, this was uh, something that was very difficult to accept uh, uh, and very difficult to understand uh, and so it was taken on face value that uh, in fact, uh, if you do this the, uh, the system seems to explain the data. So, so th on that basis this uh, process was accepted. However, we have come a long way since he, he has actually uh, 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 he stumbled upon this discovery of uh, quantum mechanics and he uh, initiated this entire science of quantum mechanics and of course, he won a Nobel prize for this in 1918. Uh, even uh, very recently, uh, uh, this is something that has uh, lingered on over the, there are a lot of uh, uh, famous scientists who have, uh, uh, who have uh, come about uh, 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 since then and who have done a lot of work which, which is sort of related to quantum mechanics and, and therefore, there are several Nobel prizes which, which are sort of associated with this general area. In fact, if you see uh, even recently, uh, relatively recently uh, in the year 2006, the Nobel prize for physics okay, so the, uh, was given to uh, Mather and Smoot. Uh, who are here for their discovery of the black body form uh, of uh, cosmic microwave background radiation. So, they basically sent out a satellite which looked at the background radiation in the universe okay, and uh, they made a plot of the data that was obtained from the uh, um, radiation available in the universe just coming, coming towards earth. When you make a plot of this data, it turns out that it is, it is a plot that has exactly the same form that we, we have drawn on the board of that of a black body. In other words, the universe is giving out radiation which, which actually has the same kind of form that at some uh, wavelengths uh, at very uh, high wavelengths it drops to 0, at very low wavelengths it drops to 0 and somewhere in the middle uh, you actually have a peak. And uh, based on this peak they have even been uh, and so this general form fit uh, the black body radiation uh, uh, data that we have drawn and it also exactly fit the uh, Planck distribution law and uh, therefore, uh, they were able to actually tell us the background temperature of the universe and it is uh, based on their calculations, the temperature of the universe, the background uh, temperature of the universe is about 2.7 uh, Kelvin, 2.75 Kelvin is the background temperature they have for the universe. So, in other words naturally uh, uh, it, is, it is generally believed that uh, naturally speaking you will not have a temperature lower than this anywhere else in the universe. So, that is the natural uh, low temperature that exists in the universe, it is slowly cooling, it is uh, from the time the universe was uh, 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 came into existence in the manner that we, we currently understand that it did. Uh, uh, the, the temperature of the universe has been steadily coming down average temperature and this is the current temperature of the background of the universe. So, this is uh, something that they uh, uh, discovered by sending out uh, a satellite, it is called the cosmic uh, background uh, experiment or COBE, COBE. you can uh, look it up uh, in any of uh, the sources that you may have access to uh, and they will show you the actual data that they obtained uh, from this uh, experiment and the temperature that, uh, 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 that corresponds to that uh, particular data. So, you can see that this is a uh, this is this data this black body radiation uh, is not simply uh, a matter of uh, some uh, esoteric curiosity of a few people, it is not something that you can say it is it is some uh, uh, experiment uh, which uh, exists in some uh, uh, very uh, uh, particular conditions in a lab and it is of no real relevance to uh, day to day life. Uh, it is in fact, it, uh, it captures a very fundamental aspect of how energy uh, exists in our uh, uh, universe and how it behaves uh, and how matter interacts with energy. A very fundamental aspect of this entire process of interaction of matter and energy and how it exists in our universe is captured uh, very elegantly in this uh, simple experiment of a black body. And uh, therefore, even though in the year 1900 or just in the years preceding 1900, it looked like one of those few small experimental phenomena that were that still needed a little more explanation, but soon would be ironed out. It, uh, it ended up that it was the, uh, it, it, it had hidden in it a very fundamental aspect of science that we uh, that uh, thanks to Max Planck uh, we have uh, stumbled upon and we have discovered. Okay, so so this is the origin of quantum mechanics uh, as uh, an, uh, an exploration of this black body radiation, uh, which has which seems to have such profound consequences and uh, of uh, is of such profound significance uh, that we even know uh, things about the universe. We are able to tell the temperature of uh, the uh, uh, sun. We are able to ten, tell the temperature of stars and so on which are uh, millions of uh, uh, kilometers away from us or millions of light years away from us. Uh, we are able to do all that thanks to our understanding of uh, uh, this black body radiation and how uh, the theory behind it is. So, it is a very uh, phenomenal uh, uh, discovery and uh, uh, science behind it uh, and it is the origin of quantum mechanics uh, and, uh, and, and what we will do in, in the rest of our course is to take some of these principles of quantum mechanics uh, and apply it uh, to our uh, uh, subject of study which is electrons in a solid 
and see how well it explains the uh, theories that uh, exist in uh, uh, the, uh, the data that we get from the solid. In the next class, we will continue our discussion on the uh, history of quantum mechanics, because there are a few other uh, uh, specific relationships, uh, uh, which are considered very important uh, aspects of quantum mechanical behavior. And we will at least become familiar with those uh, relationships, uh, and uh, see how they inter integrate with respect to each other, because it is that body of relationships that together we will take and utilize when we uh, examine the uh, uh, electrons in a solid. So, we will have one more class, which looks at the history of quantum mechanics, and then we will get back to utilizing those concepts to study the uh, material behavior. Okay. Thank you.